It's a real pleasure. You've, uh, well, those of you that have been here for previous sessions, you'll undoubtedly see um, Anne chairing a couple of those. Um, but Anne is now going to speak to us um, about radical contextualism. Is that right? Yes. Okay, um, so I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, and as a colleague here at MMU in the Department of History, Politics and Philosophy, um, and she's one of the philosophers there. Um, so, over to you, Anna. Thank you, and thank you all for staying, and most of all, thank you, Philip, for this invitation and for a highly successful conference. So I think we should give Philip a huge round of applause. And I hope that we will hear more about the relaunch and indeed the, uh, uh, the reappearance of the Mind Society in due course. So, um, the title of my talk is Affordances and Situated Representation, uh, and what I want to do is to examine uh, a contemporary debate over the content view, specifically the rich content view defended by Susanna Siegel at Harvard University, according to which, so this is the position, that all visual experiences are conceptually structured and represents objects as having rich, having a rich variety of higher level properties, such as kind properties and causal properties at their very, uh, in their content. Uh, the argument for the rival anti-intellectualist account uh, is also one that I would address in passing to motivate the view. Uh, this is a position uh, that uh, also Siegel takes her cue from, and that is the position that you find in Gibson's account of what this is, and also that of Murray Bourdieu. Um, the anti intellectualist, so called agent first approach to perception, is typically presented as a challenge to the content view. And what Professor Siegel wants to do in her in defending her position is to undermine the motivation that drives it. Um, however, the conclusion that I will be working towards is that there is a third alternative, uh, which is a normative account of perception to both that of the content view and specifically Dreyfus reading of Merle Fondi based on the notion of situated representation that you find um, prominently in authors like Charles Travis. Uh, and I would argue that this normativist position can help shed new light on the old idea on affordances and um, action-oriented perception in general. Uh, before I start, I, I want to draw attention to two quotations that also figures in Charles Travis's recent paper, Affording Us the World. The first one comes from Darwin, and here we get a sense for this idea of affordances that I will um, elucidate further. So as I, Darwin writes as, for, as follows in Mind and World. In a common medieval outlook, what we now see as the subject matter of natural science was conceived as filled with meaning, as if all of nature were a book of lessons for us. And it is a mark of intellectual progress today that educated people now take that idea seriously, cannot now take that idea seriously, except perhaps in some symbolic role. So this idea of the world being a book that is there for us is precisely what motivates both the Marie Compontis um, account and also psychologists like, um, um, like Gibson. Likewise, we find a similar sentiment in paragraph 430 of the Philosophical Investigations when Wittgenstein writes as follows. It is as though we had imagined that the essential thing about a living person was his outer form, and so produced a block of wood in this form, and were abashed to see the dead block, which had no similarity to the living being at all. So here again we have this image of a de dead 
versus a live nature for us. Um, so the content view is simply the view that perceptual experiences have contents which, in self, which themselves uh, represent the world. Against that view, so-called uh, anti-representationalist uh, positions, uh, come in two broad categories. Um, the first broad kind of anti-representationalism is uh, what Ben Snane refers to as inactivism. Inactivism is motivated by what Susanna Siegel calls an action first approach to visual perception, which foregrounds the role of the perceiver as an, as an involved perceptual agent, an actor, with an embodied stance upon the world. Taking their cues from Maliponti and Gibson, who both held that the paradigmatic cases of perceptions are byproducts of action plans, inactivists hold that perception is an active and dynamic process between the agent and her affordance-laden information packed lived environment. As opposed to the uh, representationalist idea that perception is fundamentally a relation between the subject and the world, that is in some sense mediated by static, static entities, like perceptual representations. As Ballard puts it in her book from came out in 2006, the world is the repository of the information needed to act. With respect to the observer, it is stored out there and by implication not represented internally in some mental state that exists separately from the stimulus. That's the extent that drives the inactivist position. Um, secondly, we also have views that are commonly referred to as relationalist position. Relationalists also deny that perceptual states are representations in this mediating sense. Instead, they take perceptual states to be relations not between a, a perceiver and some abstract entity called perceptual content, but instead they regard perception to be a genuine relation between a perceiver and an external concrete particular, namely the perceived object. So Susanna Siegel's interest in affordances is to accommodate the phenomenon in question where action seems to the subject to be out of her directly by her lived environment as belonging to the admissible contents of experience itself. So the strategy is to incorporate all these affordance properties as being part of the rich content of experience itself. And thereby, you have also hopefully uh, uh, foreclosed and indeed uh, undermined the key anti representationist motivation. So, if you can't, if you can't, um, if you can't deny the phenomena, you instead incorporate it in order to uh, in incorporate the motivation for the authentic position. <coughs> now, because Charles Travis. Uh, denies also that mental states, as opposed to their processes, the agents, uh, uh, represent. Uh, Travis is often represented, it's often said to be advocating a no content view of visual experience. Uh, however, the conclusion that I will be arguing towards is that <coughs> given the centrality <coughs> of um, of the general notion of occasion sensitivity in the discussion of perception, a better characterization of Travis's own position is to say that it points towards a normative account of perceptual content. So that's the kind of moves in perceptual space uh, that I will be addressing. So 
the seeds of arguments against the content view, in other words, in the inactivist line of thought, such as Herbert Draper's in particular, he discusses experiences of salient action possibilities in ongoing action, such as playing tennis, responding to the field as it unfolds before you, or that of navigating a passer by on the pavement without collision. The point here is that the information needed to act in this pregnant sense don't involve internal representations, but is always already externally stored in the world. In other words, there is no need for an experiential representation to guide action in, say, a passes by scenario. So from this, I think we can distinguish two broad approaches uh, to perceptual experience. Um, and put very broadly, we have on the one hand the action first approach, which is what you find in the inactivist line of thought. Uh, on this conception, the perceiver is fundamentally conceived as an agent who is involved in her lived uh, life world. Um, and the paradigm example of experience here is often said to be that of motor activity. Uh, and not only are experiences by products of actions, they are also often held to be constitutively linked to them. Contrast that with a Cartesian model, which I would refer to as the spectator first approach to perceptual experience. Here we have a model of the perceiver as a detached observer. Uh, and the paradigm example here is often taken to be visual. So you have the problem of the visual experience where in some sense you stand facing the world in a detached spectator like way. So, just to gloss the notion of uh, the locution involved perceiver the, in relation to affordances and situated representation more generally, we may contrast two types of affordance here. So on the one hand, and this distinction also comes from Susanna Stevens' own account. Uh, so we can contrast the proto-affordance uh, that involve objects without agency, a mere possibility in my terminology. By contrast, a proper affordance in this rich action-oriented sense involve possibilities of action for a creature where the relevant sense of possibility is not just any old possibility but rather that of salience, that which is, uh, in some sense, uh, meaningful to you given your perceptual field and vital projects. So we find Dreyfus defending something like uh, the idea of affordance proper in uh, the following uh, paragraph where he maintains that the most basic function of perception is something like this. We directly perceive affordances and respond to them without beliefs and justifications being involved. Moreover, these affordances are interrelated and it is our familiarity with the whole context of affordances that gives us our ability to orient ourselves and find our way about. So the idea here is very much that of uh, uh, navigating a rich sense of environment where the, the world is precisely this book that gives you clues and you choose how to respond to it. So we no longer have a sharp separation between the subject and her external world. It's rather an interrelated process. 
So the reason why this matter is for Siegel is uh, just the purely conceptual concern over the content view. Uh, why this matters more generally, this is my claim, is because of the controversy of the broad notion of evaluative perception, this idea, not just of moral and aesthetic properties, but that of picking up on social cues in a way where normativity is at issue. So for instance, a nice example here that I often use in other papers in moral philosophy is that of uh, seeing a visually tired person on the bus. And there's something evaluative in the narrow sense of such a case. However, a mature and reasonable, decent person will respond, will ought to respond to that in a certain way. And if you don't, there is something of normative importance that you have missed. So that sense of evaluative perception is, I think, what is really at issue when it comes to action-oriented perception. So, so um, just to be even more clear, um, the motivation um, and also specifically in Siegel's use of Gibson's notion of, of the involved perceiver as an agent uh, can also be helpfully illuminated by contrast with a camera model of perception. So here is one way of spelling out the spectator approach to perception more, more generally. Uh, so the camera model implies something like the following thesis about perception. So if we have first a view about content, the content of perception is like a photograph. It represents the world like a photograph. It's a snapshot of reality. Secondly, intentionality, or aboutness, or this, that we can be of the world in perception, is false, is, um, is a matter of uh, perceiving the world, perceptions <coughs> of the world, in virtue of representing it. Uh, the perceiver in question is detached, not involved in the scene, in the same way as a camera is not involved in its scene. It's more, it's rather an automatic process. Uh, and fourthly, awareness of one's perceptions is analogous to awareness of photographs. It's like the inner eye surveying snapshots in introspection. The reason why I mentioned the camera model is that it is precisely the camera model that authors such as Merle Ponty wants to reject in, in his account. Instead, he uses what I think of as a broadly normative understanding of perception, and specifically the idea of perspective and point of view in perception. Uh, and what's interesting with Siegel's work is that even though she defends a content view of perception, she uses similar evaluative or normative, if there is some difference, framework in examining <coughs> the phenomenon of what she refers to as, as experiential mandates, as an e aspect of the content of perception <coughs> and its implication for how we should think of the perceiver as an agent. So her model, whilst being a content view, wants to reject the spectator construal of the perceiving agent, or, 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 the, or the, 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 the perceiver, in ways that <coughs> is typically uh, not um, made compatible. Um, the difference between Siegel's account and that of Merle Ponty is that Merle Ponty at least seems to locate intentionality directly in the world. Yeah. Interesting problematic sense, as opposed to our perception 
representational experience or affordance of the world, Siegel maintains that we can enrich our concept of representational perceptual content in a way that accommodates precisely the Merlin quality insight. Uh, and with it, then, the abandonment of the thought camera model. Um, and what I want to argue is that there is an alternative argument available for those of us who are interested in Merle Pontus' insight to the effect that the sharp contrast between the so-called objective and subjective side of the intentionality relation we have inherited from the camera model is itself a false dichotomy. So in what follows, I take no stand whatsoever uh, over the status of using the early Pontus account of perception as such. So my aim here is not to determine whether or not the account should in fact not be understood at all as a piece of philosophy of perception, but rather one belonging to ex extension metaphysics. And I just don't take any stand on that debate here. Uh, nor will I enter into any detailed discussion of, of Merle Pontus' own highly original treatment of particular topics in theory of perception, such as spatial awareness and so on. Uh, instead, the alternative normative account that I want to at least point toward is suggesting that the focus of many contemporary arguments in narrowly construed philosophy of perception over the content view and indeed the so-called no content view typically ascribed to Charles Travis is misplaced. So the normativist view that I advocate, I think, should be open for, for, um, to all sides without thereby taking sides on the perceptual content debate as such. I want to project the terms on which that debate is often conducted. Um, and that brings us back to Simon's talk this morning, uh, namely that of occasional sensitivity and specifically that of occasionalism. Uh, and I think what came out nicely in Simon's talk is that even though authors like Kaplan and Lepore take Travis to be a central proponent of what they term radical contextualism, which they define as claiming that all terms in natural language are context sensitive, um, contextualism and Travis's position are best held apart. And the reason for that is that despite some of the similarities in the kinds of arguments deployed in thinking about meaning and by extension content in relation to context, Travis's distinctive Wittgenstein perspective takes us back to the basic point of, con of contention that has existed between formal theories of meaning and use-based account from the very start. And that is the basic controversy as to whether or not words and sentences, and in the case of perception, by extension, perception experiences, make claims about the world or if it is rather only people who can make claims in that way. And as we will see, Travis's own account of perceptual experience is precisely the view that only the possessors of experiences can, in some sense, be of the world and be held accountable in perception for their perceptual responses. Okay, so on this view then, um, occasionalism, there is simply no such thing as determinate content outside a context <coughs> where it's only in use that words and concepts come to have particular conditions of applications. As Wittgenstein himself puts it in 
432 in the Hypothetical Investigations, every sign by itself seems dead. What gives it life? It's in use, it is alive. So this then is the view of meaning and by extension perceptual experience that Travis is traces back to the later Wittgenstein. And he writes as follows in characterizing his own position. The point of the discussion of language games, which with philosophical investigations begins, is that naming or referring underdetermines conditions for correctness of wholes, notably where relevant conditions for their truth. Holes with a given reference uh, embedded in different language games would be true under any of many very different sets of conditions. True and false are, in the first instance, evaluations of particular historical events, speakings of words on particular occasions, in particular circumstances and of the fittingness of the words for those circumstances. So while this may at first blush sound like straightforward contextualism that we all know from Kaplan and so on, the position is in, is in fact more radical that, than many of the standard contextualism would want to endorse. Um, and for Travis, this idea of underdetermination is held to be a feature of representation in general, not just language, not just thought, and hence it holds for uh, not just thought but also experience itself. So on this view, there can't be any contextual filling out of a linguistically expressed content to get to the complete content the speaker had in mind. For this kind of content, it context independent content is non-existent. One reason for thinking this is various examples that we'll come back to. The point here is that the very same analysis of an independent, truth-evaluative content being uh, non-existent except for uh, uh, um, uh, uh, from speaking to particular occasions, Travis will hold the very same view of experience, whereby the very perceptual content of experience will determine is only determined by how it is reasonable to take the, ad, uh, the agent as representing the world in some particular situation. So the, the emphasis again is on the agent as opposed to some independently specifiable thing that in some sense mediates between the agent and her world. Um, and it is that point, I think, would uh, raise the problem for Siegel's own position. Okay, so uh, back to uh, back to uh, Siegel's initial position. So the goal is to explore whether or not a special class of experience or affordances, which she calls experienced mandates, uh, belongs to the admissible context <coughs> of sense perception. And her answer is yes. The notion of an experienced mandate on this account is defined as follows. Experiences of the immediate environment as compelling you to act in a way that is solicited by the environment or by things in it, as opposed to merely being afforded. So the idea here is of that of a solicited account, whereas it is something distinctly experiential. So the centrality 
of the actual account is that there is a central phenomenological feature of the experienced mandate. The activity is experienced as coming from the thing, as some sense pulling an action out from you, like in Draper's own <coughs> whole case of the tennis game. You see the ball, the ball, it's coming towards you, it's pulling a response directly from you. So uh, the examples that figure in the discussion are uh, quite fun. So the first one is that of the cake. So the claim is that you, uh, given the appropriate circumstances, you will experience the cake as telling you to eat it. Yeah. This can happen. I know it from personal experience. <laughs> Likewise, and this is, um, we had a lot of fun with this. Uh, I actually came up with the example myself. It's, it's a bit contrived, but, but it's one that is drawn from real life. And that is the example of hair. And the situation here is uh, in a supervision meeting with you know, the students who've got long hair. Yeah? It keeps falling into your face. So the example here is that you feel, you feel prompted by the tuft of hair to move it away from his eye. You can't, you can't have a conversation. I have no idea whether or not your student is listening or not. So this tuft of hair is, is pulling you <laughs> towards it in some sense. Uh, a less contrived example is perhaps that of forest, where there you are, uh, like uh, last night, four o'clock in the morning, those of us who are still out partying, huge rain storms coming in, suppose there was a forest in the vicinity, you might then have felt pulled towards the forest to enter it for shelter. And then finally we have the case of, te of tennis. Uh, you feel that your comportment was, was in some sense prompted by the perceived conditions in such a way as to reduce a sense of deviation from some satisfactory result, and this is his own example. Um, in the case of uh, moral philosophy, we find uh, the example of, in McDowell of the, the shy person. You feel prompted by her shyness to respond with kindness. Again, if you're suitably brought up and all the rest of it. Um, there is a beautiful example from Ray Langton of the child in the crowd, this abandoned, this alone child in the crowd, where the situation is telling you to intervene in some sense. Yeah. Noticing this alone ch child in the crowd pull something towards you. Um, and then my own example with the visually tired person on the bus, again, if you are a mature, reasonable person, um, you feel obliged to give up your seat insofar as you have some sense of moral decency. Um, finally, we have <coughs> an example of, from Travis, which is uh, about pigs, like most of these examples. Uh, the case here is the pig of the loose. So the pig is on the loose. Pick up the baby. And just given the right, that's the prompt that you would experience, again, if you have some sense of concern for your relatives. <coughs> okay, so a couple of things to note about these examples. Um, the, we should, I think, sharply distinguish between what I think of as discernment, which is a kind of practical, acquired competence that, that involves drawing on your uh, inhabited nature, as opposed to I think of as mere seeing. So the mandates that involve so-called affordance properties of various types uh, are such that they are um, recognised. Uh, and the distinction between the soliciting and mandating aspects of experience is precisely that draws on salience. The reason why certain responses to the inhabited environment is, uh, uh, is experienced as demanded from you is because of their salience to your projects at the time, which is quite different from simply thinking about the various, perhaps 
infinite possibilities uh, that you may have. Uh, so we should distinguish between mere possibility, which may precisely not have this in both sense of being drawn either way to respond in some way or other, uh, but rather when we're dealing with salience, that's <coughs> really where the notion of affordance trouble comes into play. Um, so the key difference for Siegel between the two notions, uh, namely that of uh, affordance proper, uh, affordance proper involving salience and that of mere possibility, is that only the notion of salience have accuracy conditions. And so she will maintain that there are accuracy conditions and in this very minimal sense, um, these affordance, uh, affordances uh, belongs to um, the abstract notion of the experience. Okay, so um, may I should also point out that the, the claim here is not that the uh, idea of resolicitating affordance, um, it doesn't mean that the thing <coughs> is actually doing any cries for help as such. The claim isn't the cake is telling you to eat it. It's a feature of representation of how, given an involved stance on the world, how the world is always already laden with these action possibilities, which then you can tell some metaphysical story if you want, but that's not part of the, the claim. Um, and I think we, we get to the importance of this contrast, namely the contrast between the, the, uh, the idea of affordance being a feature of your, represent, uh, your represented, um, comported way of being in the world, as opposed to um, having some metaphysical story, by uh, examining the relationship between three items more closely. And the three items that I have in mind are that first of an action possibility, secondly that of salience, and thirdly that of normativity. So for Gibson, in his account of perception from the 60s, um, the main claim that one can perceptually represent a cake as being edible, thus understood as something you can do, is for him construed as a mere possibility. Uh, the first important difference is that Gibson argued that we perceive affordances, whatever they may be, rather than perceiving objects as having these properties. Further, uh, the property of being, say, edible, in the case of the egg of the cake, uh, is not the same thing as the property of affording some specific action in ways that will become important when it comes to deciding exactly what the determinate content is there. So as uh, Ben Snane notes for Gibson, the property of affording some unique or some specific action Q is not a property of what we can do with an object, but rather what we should do with it. So insofar as we may speak of uh, a property of affording some specific action, that's when we are in the realm of appropriateness or not. So, uh, as Gibson uses the concept of affordance, then we may attribute full normativity to affordances proper, in the sense that we sometimes perceive objects as having properties of what we ought to do with them, not merely properties of what we can do with them. So there's a sense here that uh, it's not you're responding with rationality to your lived environment, so there's a structure to your uh, relatedness and indeed your relatedness in the world. Uh, 
Um, and just an, as an aside, I mean, this feature is very important for people like Mattel. So again, uh, similar to Siegel, you have the claim that the activity is experienced as coming from the thing or the situation as perceived. Um, however, that doesn't actually tell us anything at all about the relationship between action, representation and attention in the relevant notion of mandates that Siegel is interested in. Uh, specifically, we need to know more about how to relate the idea of affordances in this sense uh, to the general idea of perceptual guidance that is also very much present in Noli Pontus account, which is the idea <coughs> of action in the light of what you see, be it some frame person on the bus and so on. It's it's you're being guided by your perception in that sense. Um, and I think there is an open question as to whether or not there is so much even room for this idea on a very minimal account of, uh, of truth conditions that Siegel is operating with. Um, so, um, I should say also that in the literature in this area, in the analytic tradition of the last few years, there's been quite a lot of discussion about precisely this idea of perceptual, well, experiential guidance. Um, and for Sebastian Watts, for instance, um, he maintains that experiential guidance is not the claim that experience represents affordances. It is rather that um, that uh, it might be represented by the experience as such. Um, however, if we follow Dreyfus's idea, he maintains that facts about what affords what are not what we are directly open to. For his, his view, it is rather the affordances solicitations, such as the attraction of an apple when I'm hungry, to which I am directly open. You're not, on his view, open to the further fact as to what might afford what. Um, by contrast, that's precisely the claim that Siegel wants to make in order to accommodate um, um, the, well, in order to, to to defend her distinctively, what her, her distinctive claim that there is a phenomenal phenomenological character to these experiences. So, so there is a question on how we should understand precisely this aspect of the view, namely the phenomenological feature that the experience is supposed to be. Uh, appreciated as coming from the thing. Um, the challenge of explaining this phenomenon is again one that comes from the challenge of explaining the motivational flow in action oriented perception. Um, so the thesis, as I read it, is that the contents in question is which contents that incorporate these not just topics like, like, like being edible but also um, affordances as motivating you to act in a discrete way is um, reflect both the arousal of this pull but also the motivating aspect of experienced mandates. So in attributing to be fight properties to the things that the subject experiences as solicit them to do that very thing, that's the sense in which uh, Siegel wants to maintain that experience mandates have ac the accurate conditions X is to be fined by virtue of their component 
reception experience of having those confidence. And it is precisely in that sense that the position locates experience mandates squarely into the domain of the con in, the, in the content new by point <coughs> putting the mandated motivating affordances into the very content of the prospective perception experience. Um, so, actually, that was a mistake. Um, so, so far, we only have the, 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 the pull explained. What about the motivating aspect? So, the link here again with more philosophy, where you is it the case that in recognizing, well, in holding something, to, that something ought to be done, that you're thereby motivated to do it so? Um, Siegel discusses quite, quite some length, and she wants to draw a contrast between. Um, the, um, the pull of the thing on the one hand and you're being motivated to act upon it. And she gives the example of uh, music. And we may think here of <coughs> Euro trash. Yeah? It is designed to make you move, right? You, you can feel it telling you to dance, but you may resist it. Precisely because you may not appreciate your own trash. You may you may think of your that as a bad part of yourself, for instance. Nonetheless, you can hear it school and yet uh, resist it. And I think we can probably think of similar examples. Uh, the challenge here is what, if anything, can <coughs> differentiate between pairs of cases that, that differ only in this way <coughs> consistently with experiencing the mandate as issuing from the thing perceived rather than from a joint venue or thing perceived plus your own desires, for instance. Yeah? So for the content view to succeed, it must build in this cognitive element in the content as well. And that is the real challenge for, for you. To respond to this challenge, uh, <laughs> Siegel draws an analogy, uh, an, uh, analogy um, with uh, Lisa Bolotti's discussion of delusions of reference in the case of the, the mental health case. Um, so consider the case of meeting another person's case. Something like motivation is found in the idea of feeling answerable to another person in meeting that person's case at least in the minimal sense of looking at it and the space of looking back and so forth. Um, but there are two kinds here of looking back that we may <coughs> distinguish in the case of uh, faith meetings in this case. Uh, so cons consider first the, the real life case whereby you look back at someone looking at you with a sense of reciprocity and mutual answerability in favour in a very interesting sense. And that sense is precisely what's missing in the television case. Looking at someone on TV who's looking into the camera. In both cases, you feel looked at, perhaps. But there's also a difference that's brought into focus by precisely delusions of reference where the deluded subjects assimilate both cases to the live case. In such delusion, a subject watching TV feels that the, the broadcaster is addressing her, not just whoever, whoever, whoever might be listening. And you can have the same case in the ordinary case of uh, hearing the song on the radio being played for <coughs> you. Right? It's a delusion of reference there because it's not very clear to you at all. It's just mistaking the broadcast case with the real live case. So the question here is what do, do the deluded subject feel when they feel addressed by the broadcaster on TV? Siegel says the following. They feel a need to negotiate social space that goes with being seen, 
the negotiation involves unavoidable response, either in answering or ignoring. But ignoring someone looking at you feels different from being aware of them looking at you. By contrast, the deluded subject feels moved by the broadcaster in a way that others normally feel moved only by other people who are in the same immediate surroundings. So in the case of the deluded subject who looks at TV and feels addressed, the, we're dealing with the special case of misattribution here. Uh, the deluded subject misattributes to the televised faces answerability generating uh, hoods. Uh, and that is also the story that Susanna Siegel goes on to tell about the cake. So when the cake merely solicitates you to eat it, it looks as if it is to be eaten. But this solicit solicitation doesn't generate any motivation. The cake, in this case, is like the broadcaster talking to you by talking to whoever might be listening. By contrast, when the cake solicits you in a way that feel, it leaves you feeling compelled to eat it, it is as if it is to be eaten. The case, the cake is looking at you, and you feel answerable to it. It's a silly example, but it's it's nice because it brings out quite clearly what's at, what's at stake here. I think. So, from this, we get the refined modified version of the content view as followed. So on the content view in question, experienced mandates have contents of the form X to be fried, premised in the sense of answerability generating conditions. Take away that genuine answerability um, feature and you no longer have the uh, the sort um, um, correctness condition in question. So the, the upshot so far is that there are contents that can reflect the features of experience mandates that may seem most resistant to the spectator first approach. Even if our experiences are by and large structured by experience mandates, the role of the spectator never disappears completely, even when we are in the throes of the action. So with that hope, the hope is also that the content view is rescued. So the question then is, well, is this really the best we can do? Well, of course, we can revert back to a non-conceptualist position that many authors take at Moliponte to be generating. Um, I suggest that we can uh, point to a third alternative at the point here. So I guess the real question here is whether or not it makes sense to compare answerability and misattribution in visual perception to the asymmetry of relating to somebody, somebody as you, someone whom you can have a first personal concern distinctive of the addresser addressee relation and relating to just anyone? Uh, I think the answer is no, unless we rethink intentionality in action oriented perception, what it is to be directed at the world as an always already situated historical agent. So one way of getting to that, that idea is to uh, hear more about the structure of the relevant notion of the complex experience that Siegel ends up defending. So one suggestion here is that what she's really interested in is precisely the kind of gestalt structures that drove Merle Pontus' uh, account initially. <coughs> that is to say, if experienced mandates are plausibly understood as organized unities or gestalts, and not merely as the sum 
of its component parts. How then are we to understand the contribution of the feature of its organisation, the particular way in which the relevant components interact together in the particular case at hand? So the only way I think that the defender of the content view can respond to that specific challenge is to hold that it is part of the story of the accuracy of conditions for experience mandates um, that you can, in some sense, be aware that you are facing this solicitation. Um, <coughs> and in ways that, that depends crucially on the idea of on there being a, a like a perceptual look to the question, to the property in question. Um, and it is precisely at this point that the occasionalist, like Travis, will respond that there just is no such perceptual look to be had. Um, and this is the, uh, where we end this talk in the last five minutes. So, in his recent book, uh, Perception, specifically the article, uh, both um, the preserve of thinkers, but also in the article, Affording Us the World, Travis, is, Travis argues against the view that mental states represents. And he starts out by distinguishing among three notions of representation. <coughs> the first one is what he refers to as effect representation. Secondly, we find auto representation. And thirdly, we have what he refers to as allo representation. The important contrast is between the first uh, sense of effect representation, which is claimed to be a two-place relation between two historical circumstances. So you can think of Bryce's natural meaning here, clouds meaning rain and so on, uh, or for that matter, a child's footstep, well, uh, uh, the, uh, a child's footstep in the sand represents the child who left it behind. So there is a kind of representation there, but it's, it's a relation between two historical events. Uh, and that isn't what we need in the relevant sense, because that would only ever generate a merely causal relation that doesn't deal in uh, Russia, in, it doesn't get us into the space of reasons, as it were. Um, and Travis's point is that unlike effect representation, this relation between two historical events, um, both representation and allo representation are the preserve of thinkers in the way that Wittgenstein argues that content is exclusively the preserve of uh, linguistic agents, not their <coughs> synthesis. So um, both of them are claimed to be three place relations uh, where to what to represent is to assume that things are a certain way or to passively take things to be a certain way. Um, the difference between water representation and the third most important uh, uh, notion of uh, allo representation is that the latter isn't simply a condition you are in. It is rather something that you that one does when one sends a message in communication and takes responsibility for its accuracy. Travis maintains that this is what we do in perception, in representing the world as being one way rather than the other. Since perceptual experience aren't agents, Travis continues, they can only affect, represent in this two place relational sense. Um, and as I just said, that relation isn't interesting because it would be a merely course of relationship. So that's the view. Uh, there are two arguments presented in favour of that view. Let me say again, against thinking that perceptual experience is representational in the sense that C 
see you know, leads. Um, the first argument uh, turns on the sexual looks, which was precisely where we ended in the discussion of Siegel's position. Uh, and the idea here is that say, sexual looks is just the way things look like. That's a perception. Yeah. Travis maintains that there, is no su there are no such things um, in the forms of in the sense that there is no determinant answer in the abstract as to how, th how a thing should look for it to be counted as the kind of thing or the kind of concept that it, it would fall under. Um, so Travis, in his most latest book, uh, uh, he gives the example of a chrome yellow Porsche. Uh, a chrome Porsche would normally look yellow in broad daylight. But suppose Pierre's car, even though it's painted that colour, is covered in beige mud. Should we then say that the car looks chrome yellow or that it looks beige? This question, Travis argues, can only be settled by rational discussion, reasons given among action uh, agents who have grasped how cars ought to look in broad daylight. There is simply no pre-given determining answer as to when it is true to say that the car looks chrome yellow or and when it doesn't. And again, because these questions, how it is reasonable, reasonable or not to take something in a shared perceived environment, uh, these kinds of questions can only be settled, settled by rational agents Given the circumstances, again, because perception experiences aren't agents, perception experiences can't have content even in this minimal sense of content. Uh, the second argument against the representation of view for Travis um, turns in a similar but <coughs> distinct way on his trademark argument from sensitivity. Uh, its main force as applied to the case of perception is the claim that the agent's sense, sense of the agent um, taking responsibility and assuming answerability for in thought and language uh, requires performing certain selection tasks in determining how things are reasonably to be taken in a given conversational context. So whether or not an object counts as milk depends on context on this view. So this is a nice example of spilled mil milk in the fridge. Suppose Sid is sitting at the table <coughs> and wants to know if there's any milk in the house for his morning cafe latte. Pia, who is fed up with uh, doing the domestic course and also is fed up with doing the weekly shopping, uh, replies, there is milk in the fridge. Now, even though the fridge contains a puddle of milk at the bottom of it, it doesn't count as milk in the, con in the given conversational context. It would be force of Pia to respond to poor Sid that there is milk in the fridge in what is reasonable to take her as have said in that context. That is to say, what the word milk means in the present context depends on the selection tasks that the speaker hearers are performing in determining what is and what isn't relevant or salient here. And again, performing these selection tasks requires drawing on acquired parochial cognitive abilities, the engagement of your second nature, as it were, that only agents can possess. 
since mental states can't perform these selection tasks, they can't Arlo represents in this um, sense of making a claim to your perceived environment. So if mental states can't Arlo represent in this way, then they don't have content even in that second minimal sense. So that's the, that's the two arguments. Um, and the reason why it matters specifically for affordances is that this, if we think of affordances as one that is, one, uh, that, is um, that has to do with, with salience as opposed to mere possibility, <coughs> to get the grip of what the salience involves would similarly involve this, uh, this sense of rationality in action in ways that seem very difficult to capture even in the sophisticated uh, version of the content view that we find in Siegel's position. Um, and so what we have here is uh, a way of reading Merle Pontu perhaps, uh, or at least, so, so Trump's position is effectively that perception simply presents the perceiver with a chunk of the world. The conceptual capacities are drawn into play in performing these selection tasks and also in determining how it is reasonable to classify your lived environment given its context. And I guess the question is whether or not we can interpret Merle Pontu in this way. Um, I don't know that answer uh, as a scholarly question. Um, it raises either way another problem, which is that of meaning eliminism. It might seem that we end up with this no content view whereby uh, we are forced to say something like the following that we just have this, well it, it, it can quite qu quickly seem to bring us back to the procedure, the process view that we discussed yesterday. Um, the, the way to respond to that argument is to draw on a related argument um, against perceptual looks uh, that is presented in another paper um, and that is where Travis presents an argument against, again, the idea of perceptual looks that turns on what Hilary Putnam, following Cora Diamond, refers to as giving, uh, having a sense of the face of perception. The main thrust of that argument is that our sense for the shape of our lived environment, its significance and practical purport for us essentially involves the exercise of a kind of sensitivity to various gestalt properties or patterns where the relevant patterns are apprehended in a holistic way and not specified additively by a list of the constituent properties that brand them. So and this comes out in the case of face recognition in particular also something that Molly Conti was interested in. So when we say that two faces have the same expression, Cora Diamond writes the following. This isn't like saying the mouths are the same lengths, the eyes the same distance apart. It is not that kind of description. But it's not a description of something else, the expression, either distinct from the curved line, the dots, and so on. So from this, Putnam goes on to say that seeing an expression in the picture face isn't just a, ma it isn't just a matter of seeing the lines and the dots, rather it's a matter of seeing something in the lines in the dots. But, 
and this is the important claim against perceptual looks. That's not to say that it's a matter of seeing something besides the lines and the dots. In other words, seeing the salient lower level properties, the lines and dots, as organized in the right sort of way is part and parcel of what it is to see or apprehend the resultant facial expression. We see the sign, the smile in the face. For Travis, and this is the conclusion, to be sensitive to these things falls nothing short of the world. And here's the quotation from this paper, According Us the World, which concludes as follows. One needs to have the non-conceptual in view, which means, by which he means the world. Something on which to exercise capacities to link that of a sort to fall under given generalities, that is to say concepts, with the generalities it in fact falls under. With that in view, there is no need for any other sort of experimental intake on which to base rationally judgments as to things are in our environment. So unlike sub-personal processes, perhaps recognition mechanisms that have been studied extensively, perhaps also that is involved in the case of chicken sex that we discussed yesterday, conceptual capacities in the relevant sense of picking out these physiognomies in our lived world, addresses the very different question of what it is for something to fall under a given context, to be yellow, for instance, on an occasion. That is to say, what would and wouldn't count when? Conceptual capacities in this case moves us from one recognition routine to the next, from one way of recognizing something as yellow to another understanding of what that might involve. These kinds of achievements, Travis maintains, may not, but may indeed be beyond the reach of non-linguistic creatures, still, for all that, what these creatures see remains what we do, none other than what may come as well before there as, uh, as before our eyes. So the idea here is that we have uh, perception as a relation between uh, between the agent and uh, the world, not some linguistic item, but with relevant sense of, uh, of picking out the relevant um, appearance in one of better world, is also one that draws essentially on these conceptual capacities that disambiguates our lived environment and makes it something that our response. Okay, so I think I, I think I ended there. So thank you.